day this week. I'm going to skip the market check and get straight to Jim Bianco, president, yeah. founder of Bianco Research in New York. Love this, Jim. Good to see you. Good to see you in person. Are we mistaking inflation for retail sales? Your question, are we? I think we are. If you look at retail sales and you look at the gains, because we look at it nominally, and if you take out inflation, we haven't done anything with retail sales in two years right now. We've been trending sideways. So when you see the four-tenths of a gain in April... Remember that we also had four-tenths of a gain in inflation. So it was just really the price increase. And we're saying that was the increase in retail sales. But net, there was no new units being purchased. I might add that if you look at things like UPS and stuff, they're telling you unit sales are kind of been stagnant as well, too. So when you look at the temperature, or rather take the temperature of the U.S. economy right now, what do you find? I think we're back to where we were pre-Silicon um, Valley, because pre-Silicon Valley, when Chairman Powell spoke, he talked about a strong economy. We were talking about 6% inflation. I mean, excuse me, 6% funds rate, because the economy was, remember the, the phrase, no landing? We were back to no landing again. Yeah. And uh, so we're kind of back to that mentality, but we still have this overhang coming, and that is, what about this bank walk? What about the turmoil in the banking system? What about when we get the debt ceiling resolved and a trillion dollars of Treasury bills are going to be issued that's going to suck reserves out of the system? Does that drag the economy down later this year? But not now. Right now, it, mm -hmm. it, feels, it has this feel of early March again. In my chart of the week, without question, is what John was talking about. You've got our retail sales going up, Walmart good, and the rest of it, the luxury that John talks about. And the actual inflation-adjusted retail sales are flat. But corporations think in the nominal space. Are you saying lighten up on the stock market? No, I, I think what I was trying to say with the chart is that when people look at retail sales and they want to gauge the health of the consumer— on a unit basis or on an after-inflation basis, they're not making any ground. They're buying the same things for the same price. Yeah, but to our listeners and viewers, that says Jim Bianco says lighten up on stocks. Are you saying that? I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm kind of, you know, um, aggressively neutral on stocks right now. I think that they're going to trend sideways. My bigger theme my for the— My third divorce lawyer said that continually. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say my bigger theme on the stock market is I think we're going back to something like the 80s and 90s. We're going to go back to like a stock-picking, rotational type of— market. It isn't so much, is the S&P going to go up? It's which sectors and which stocks are going to perform. Yeah. What does aggressively neutral mean? <laughs> Seriously. It, it means what you see the chart over the last year. If you look at a chart of the S&P over the last year, it's gone sideways. It's the same place it was in May of last year, last fall, and it's in January. It's at the same point that it was. And we just kind of meander sideways. It doesn't go up. It doesn't go down. Even yesterday's big rally took us to the highest levels we've seen in a week. And so we don't go anywhere. There's really no trend. That's what aggressively neutral means. Does this account for recession or is that basically increasingly not off the table, but looking less likely? I don't think it's looking less likely. I think it, it's just it's not evident now. Ask me in the fourth quarter, where are we with the banking situation? If the bank walk, the bank walk, let me define that. People are saying, I'm going to take my money out of a one basis point yielding chase account, and I'm going to put it into a 4.8% yielding chase money market fund. And if hundreds of billions or another trillion dollars comes out of the banking system little by little by the fourth quarter, we could have a real credit crunch on our hands, and then we could be talking about a significant slowdown in the economy. We don't have that here in May. We, what we have is something that looks more like March. And I think a lot of people are trying to dismiss what's been happening with the banking uh, situation and thinking it's not a big problem. I'm not there yet. I still think it's, uh, there's still chapters to be written in that story. You've said that a few times about being back at early March. Two years about, let's call it 90 basis points south of where we were in early March. <clears throat> As you indicated, Chairman Powell was opening the door to 50 basis point hikes and we were talking about 6% Fed funds. Right. So how are you thinking about Fed funds now? and the path for the Federal Reserve, given what you've just said. Let me throw in another um, uh, nuance on it. I think that inflation is going to bottom for the year within the next 60 days because there's a gigantic base effect coming with the inflation numbers. Last year, May was 0.9. Last year, June, on inflation was 1.2. When we take those numbers out and replace them with about a 0.4, which is what we've been averaging, we should be in the low threes on the inflation numbers by July when we get the June number, and that should be the low of the year, and it should start drifting higher. So I think what Chairman Powell is going to look at is he's, he's done. He is basically higher for longer. He's at 5%. 
And nothing short of a full-blown recession, I think, is going to get him to cut rates. Do you think then we're going to slowly chip away at what's priced in this market, or do we do that all at once? How I do think you foresee gonna, that gets priced back out? I think we're going to slowly chip away. I think we're going to find that um, the majority of job creation in this country is companies of less than 500 employees. Those companies re do rely on small and medium banks. If those small and medium banks are impaired in any way to give them financial services or loans, that is going to be the chipping away at what we're going to see with the economy as it slows. And they're going to be impaired because their deposit base, they're unsure about it. It leaves. It's going to money market funds. They're not quite sure what their lending capacity will be or the profitability. This is what Oxford Economics had to say as well. They agreed with you, and they said that they think that the banking turmoil uh, begins perhaps a <clears throat> prolonged downturn akin to what we saw with the SNL crisis in the 1980s. Does that bring inflation by itself down to the ultra-low rates that we saw pre-pandemic? Do you agree with Ian Lingen's view? No, I'm going to um, – Ian's a friend, and I'm going to uh, diverge from him a little bit. I think we're in a new – I use my fancy word, post-pandemic economy, which means that we are in a higher inflation environment than we were pre-pandemic. We're in a 3 maybe 4% inflation environment, not a 6 or 8% inflation environment. And as we go forward, we're going to learn this is a very different economy than it was, say, 2019. Mm -hmm. And it has more frictions and it has more pricing problems than we've seen before. Now, eventually, we'll restructure the economy and wring that inflation out. But that's going to take several years. Uh, Jim, you're going to be with us for this half hour, which is spectacular. We lost Robert Lucas, who's a giant. And what a privilege it was to interview him another time. Truly the giant of rational expectations of questioning modern economics. Greg Mankiw said he was the single most important economist of the modern age. He wanted us to be rational. Out of the pandemic, are we are we are we rational in our expectations, or are we just making it up as we go? To me, there's very little theory going on here. No, I think we are very rational. I think what we're doing with the banks is very rational. I think that there are attitudes about work and remote work are somewhat rational as well. We needed a catalyst in order to maybe make us act on that rationality. That catalyst was we sent everybody home for a year, and then they <laughs> said and they, they kind of reassessed what they wanted to do but was afraid to do. And I think we are acting rational. Who's got it right at the moment? BlackRock get back into the office or Deutsche Bank, who are seeking to cut office space by 40 percent? Who's got it right? That's the question of the day. I think all the BlackRock resumes are going to Deutsche Bank right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and that's going to be the big push-pull between the firms that, I mean, is there a competitive advantage now by throwing that out there, that we have remote work and they want you back in the office four days a week? They've got this hybrid model over at Deutsche Bank, which means you have to come to the, the office or rather... You go home, three days of home office per week, right? Two-thirds of employees have registered for that hybrid work model. Two-thirds, which has meant they could slice office space by I, something like 40%. I, I, Lisa, help me here. I have no wisdom on this at all. I have no idea where we're going. It all changes when the labor market changes. If it doesn't get looser, then you know what? Mm. You're going to have this exact same kind of calculus. <clears throat> Jim Bianco, Bianco Research on the debt ceiling coming up next. Ken, bullish, still bullish. The chief multi asset strategist over at HSBC. Your market positive, just about by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Yields higher, just about by three basis points. Let's call it 360 now on a 10-year. On a two-year, you can call it almost 420. Yields are higher right now by a couple of basis points on a two-year. Tom, 4.176%. Let's call it 10 minutes away from the jobless claims number, 13 minutes away. We'll be watching. I don't know if the Walmart CEO's watching. I love this headline. I have no idea what it means, John. What CEO speak is this? Walmart CEO sees inflection in ROI in coming quarters. You want me to translate? Yes, please. Return on income. He also says this. He also says this. Signs of stress on consumers below the surface, and I think that's the um, the more important piece of this right yes, now. Yes, I think so. The trade and down that we clearer. are seeing potentially from elsewhere. The fact right. that the average transaction at Walmart is up, but more shoppers are coming in as well. And they're coming in from where, Lisa? And that's the trade-down story. Right. Basically, people with higher incomes going to a place with lower prices because they just can't afford what they're <clears> being charged at other establishments that we won't name or maybe we will for the rest of the show.
Your red and green on the screen. Futures up five. I guess that's a good idea. VIX 16.87 gives me no information. Who does give me information is James Bianco, president and founder of Bianco Research, who does a really allegiac uh, effort here on economics and dovetailing it into the state we're in. And then, as John mentioned, there's the debt and the deficit. I read Heil Bronner Bernstein years ago, just the Bible on all the sum of our fears here. How afeard are you of the debt debate? I'm probably more aligned with Wall Street. I mean, there's two there's two types of people when you talk about the debt uh, debate. There's those, uh, to put it in Bloomberg terms, that Anne-Marie Horton would interview that would tell you there's a 40 or 50 percent chance that we're going to default. And then there's the Wall Street types that will tell you that there's a 3 or 4 percent chance that we're going to default. And I'm probably in the 3 or 4 percent chance that we're actually going to see a default. We're going to see a lot of political theater. And I think what the markets heard from Speaker McCarthy the other day was that the president has appointed somebody to negotiate with him, so that means we're going to get a deal. And I think that a deal is largely expected in the market, and if there was not a deal, that would be the surprise. So there's a market call to make as well in that. What is your market call around this story? Um, you mean around the debt ceiling? Well, if you believe it's not priced, then you also believe you acknowledge to some degree there is some risk here. There is risk. Where do you think that risk is? I think, well, I think that risk is really in the short-term bill market. Uh, and I think that that risk is potentially in the banking system. Remember that Treasury bills, Treasury securities are used as reserves. That's a fancy way of saying they're another form of money is what they are. And if we were to default on those, we would throw the banking system into complete chaos because their reserves that they use would no longer be worth anything, at least for the day or two or three or however long we didn't pay them. That's the risk that you would face if we were to have a default. And there is a risk out there right now that um, if, this, if this negotiation falls apart, I don't think it will, but that is your risk. So you've got, a, to use a fancy word, an asymmetric risk. If there's a deal, there's going to be very little movement in the market. If there isn't a deal, we're going to have to reprice the markets then. Where well, there's a problem, the Fed has a solution, typically. Do they have a solution for that? I don't think they do, nor do I think they should. This is a political issue, is what this is. Uh, we elected congressmen and senators to represent us. And if they're in their infinite wisdom decide to represent us by defaulting on this debt, we'll have to figure to that point, out. Though, if that becomes a market functioning issue, doesn't the Fed have a role to play? It does to some extent, but you also have to be careful that you're not undoing the will of Congress. Where, where does one end the other? That's why I think that this will get resolved, because it is all on Congress if this happens, if we have a debt default. It is not on the Fed for mitigating it. What's the next crisis, then? If this gets off the crisis, off the table, then what do people focus on next? Well, I think we go back to focusing on the banking crisis. And I think we go back to focusing on, you know, go back to the senior loan officer survey. Do we see lending, you know, tighten up and continue to tighten up? And do we see problems then metastasize because lending is going to continue to tighten? And then I think the other one would probably be, if, you know, going with my forecast, do we see a bottom in inflation this summer? And then does the Fed come up short of their target and does all the talk of cuts in the funds rate by the end of the year kind of go away? Do you feel like people are exhausted by the pessimism, that they've heard the sky is falling for so long and it hasn't happened, that they're basically tuning it out and basically saying, yeah, 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 you've been wrong, which is basically <laughs> uh, some of the messaging <laughs> that I keep hearing. How much is that really kind of prevailing? Oh, uh, well, I think it's it's prevailing quite a bit. I mean, you know, it goes all the way back to the pandemic when we had the ultimate pessimism. Uh, we were all going to die. That was what we had for the pandemic. And then we, we all didn't die. So and then we've kind of recovered I mean, it's yellow. Fr from from that. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of frustration. I'll go back to what I said earlier. The markets haven't done anything. So no one is right. No one is wrong. You know, the, the optimists have, are still waiting for the breakout and the pessimists are still waiting for the breakdown. And th this just continues and the frustration continues to build. If there is a no debt ceiling default, right, and we do have that sense by the next Fed meeting, and we don't really have a sense of ongoing stress that's really uh, coming to a head in the banking system, how much of a disruptive force would the Fed be if they actually did hike rates at the June meeting? Oh, I think they would be a hugely disruptive force um, if they if they continued to hike rates. 
They would exacerbate the bank walk. I mean, this is becoming the national pastime right now is pull out your phone and brag about your money market fund. It's no longer about a meme <laughs> stock anymore. <laughs> and that would just exacerbate that. And at higher rates will then definitely filter through in the economy. I'm, count me for one that still thinks that rates matter and that if the Fed wants to rate, I know that's a <clears throat> wild crazy. thought. Yeah. yeah, but if the Fed wants to raise rates, it's going to really hurt the economy. Brent, was anybody modeling a 6% money market fund? I mean, imagine well, that. We actually, I think Lindsay Piegs I was talking about a 6% yeah. Fed funds rate still on the table, even though everyone's taken that off. And then Triple so. over cash. Uh, I, I, thank you. <laughs> uh, it, it's worked out well. We had a 2 and 20 payout last year. This year, I don't think we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Ralph Ankenpour, you're a CMT. You and yep. I adore Ralph Ankenpour. I know Ralph. He yep. was on the show, and Ralph said October was the SPX bear market low. We're up 14% SPX off the Ankenpour low. That, to me, is stunning. Nobody's talking about this. And, and a lot of people missed this lift off this low, didn't they? Yes. So we've, we're six months <clears throat> and 14% off the low. But I would also say, if you wanted to back up and look at the January high, we've only retraced half Stay the losses. Stay with me on my story here. Don't give me this <laughs> technical analysis stuff. Go with the story. Yeah. Uh, you know, the market has lifted off the low. But what I'm saying is it's still well away from the highs, and it's been meandering sideways. So, I, I, you know, I see a market without a conclusion right now in terms of the sideways. It's waiting to see what comes next. Remember the first time you read John Maggie? This is a textbook, John, written in 1940-something. You read Maggie, and it's support and, support and resistance. And the bottom line, John, is you can make up any story you want. So I got a story. I'm coming from the October low and the smart guy over here is going, no, you got to bring it back further. And it's not that glorious of a story. Technical That's analysis of stock there. trends by John Maggie. So my favorite story right now, allow me to share it with you. I can get behind this bill in Washington, D.C., the no pay for Congress during default or shutdown act. <laughs> you like that? Doesn't that sound great? Awesome. <coughs> Who's the sponsor? The sponsor, representatives, Abigail Spanberg, a Democrat, Virginia, Brian Fitzpatrick, Republican. Pennsylvania. Love that. Love that. So this is what NBC is saying. A bipartisan bill set to be unveiled today would block members of Congress from getting paid if the US enters debt default or if the government shuts down. I think we're all on board, which means one thing. If we're all on board, they certainly aren't down in Congress, are they? <laughs> well, this is revenge of the middle. This is revenge of the centrists, right? It's revenge of the guys. What are we doing here trying to gain political points and holding the U.S.'s uh, future in hand? Can you get behind that, Jim? Oh, of course totally. I can get behind that. I think we should go with when we hit the debt ceiling and retroactively stop paying them since January. I've said all along, just pay them in T-bills. <laughs> just pay them in T-bills. Pay them in January 1st T-bills and January yes. 8th T-bills. Who there did you go. want to do that? I wanted leaders? In, in the Eurozone debt crisis, they should have, they should have been paid in, in BTPs and in Greek debt. Pay the German politicians <clears throat> in, in Greek debt. debt. <laughs> that, that would have got the, things sorted quickly. The most important message is Spanberger is ex-CIA, and she won her primary 50 to 48 yep. percent. She's in the middle, True. and that's what the middle of America's thinking. Hey, Jim, this was great. Love Thank it. You. Jim Thank Bianca you. of Bianca Research. Next hour.